Many thanks indeed. And I think that really sets out a very clear vision for what the Istanbul Conference will be addressing for this incredibly important set of countries. We are just getting some water, actually. I've rocked, I'm sorry, we neglected that <laughs> fact. Can I pass straight over mm. to you, Mr. O'Brien, to sort of give your reflections on that and mm. related issues? Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Alison. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here and indeed uh, to a, an event that's obviously very well thought through and designed by both Bond and, in, and ODI. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, uh, Cheikh, for those uh, opening uh, remarks, because that very much has set the scene for what is unquestionably going to be a very important fourth United Nations conference on the least developing countries in Istanbul uh, in May. And uh, I can see that many of you around uh, are going to both want to be there, and if you can't be there, following it uh, minutely, so that we all feel that we've got our feet held to the fire. Uh, and I'm very conscious of that. As you mentioned, there were 33 of the countries out of the 48 uh, in Africa, which is the a part of the world that uh, within our new ministerial team's responsibilities I cover and have managed so far to get to uh, 13 out of the 14 in which we have different country offices. Uh, I'm about to get the, uh, the full set uh, shortly. And it's a really important opportunity as we um, approach the conference in Istanbul to take stock of how the world has changed since LDC 3 in 2001. And over this past decade, we've experienced the largest recession since World War I and the greatest democratic shift since World War II. We know that many countries are still not on track to meet the Millennium Development Goals by 2015, but, but we also know that great progress has been made globally in reducing poverty, in improving access to education for girls and boys, in tackling maternal and child mortality. So we should certainly celebrate and learn from those successes. So I'm very keen that the Istanbul Conference provides an opportunity to remind the world of the commitments made at last September's MDG Summit, a very important event, and to press for there to be clear accountability for these commitments. For all of us, that donor governments, partner countries and civil society, must work together to ensure that all of those who stepped up when the spotlight was upon them, that's it's looking very welcome, thank you very much indeed, um, and when the spotlight was upon them, honour their promises now that the applause has died away. But the Sorry, conference, you. there you are, why <laughs> do we just pass that along? Okay. But the conference will not just be about looking back. It is the great global opportunity in 2011 to talk an agenda for the future and how, and, and how we're going to agree collectively we can make the most progress possible in the years remaining to 2015 and beyond. Uh, building on what I think very often goes unremarked, and that is that in, in New York last September, there was an opportunity for the world to say it's all getting too difficult to meet 2015, and they didn't do that. They said, no, let's recalibrate how we're going to get there and recommit ourselves. And I think that uh, we should trumpet that rather more forcibly than I think uh, has been said to date. So the starting point must be that we already know a lot about what needs to be done, not from textbooks, but from the real experience of countries that have succeeded in reducing their own poverty uh, over recent years, and very recently in particular. And I'm thinking in particular of the excellent work done by UNDP in preparation for the MDG Summit last year. The UNDP's international MDG assessment looked at the experience of 50 countries, many of them LDCs, and drew a number of policy conclusions. This was not an attempt to define a blueprint. Uh, as the Nobel Prize winning economist Michael Spence has said, there is no recipe for growth and development, just ingredients which can be put together in different ways. But the UNDP assessment did seem to me to identify a number of indispensable ingredients. Top of the list is national ownership. No country has ever achieved sustained reductions in poverty in the absence of clear leadership and commitment from its government. And the most pro-poor thing a government can do is to create a climate that fosters economic growth, freeing the private sector to generate businesses, jobs and incomes. Successful countries have invested heavily in education, in health, in infrastructure, and in protecting the most vulnerable. And they have focused particularly on opportunities for women and girls. And they've laid the foundations for sustained progress through efforts to enhance governance and accountability, including by building improved systems to manage public resources and to generate domestic revenues. 
and in many ways that touches upon some of the points that uh, Jake made about, uh, and indeed Alice made in her introductory remarks, about the challenges but also the opportunities faced by landlocked countries, particularly small landlocked countries, or mm -hmm. those which are resource rich, uh, or those which are small island states, and certainly my recent visits to Ghana and Mozambique or Rwanda, uh, Malawi, all carry various characteristics of those, and it is possible to identify the critical path that will help move uh, effectively a country from our terms, uh, we might say, to graduate from aid. From their terms, and much more importantly, is to secure that growth pattern which can then uh, feed through to the broader economy and to the broader population. Uh, so again, this, this is a framework, it's not a plan, but the message is very clear. Countries that have re reduced poverty did so by going for growth and using the proceeds of that growth, growth well to drive social progress. And the other vital ingredient, of course, is the global partnership, the role that the international community plays in supporting poor countries through aid and in creating rules-based systems that are fair and indeed effective. The LDC conference in May, I believe, must signal to the world that the opportunity we now have in 2011 to progress the Doha development agenda cannot be missed. Without a fair chance to export their products, countries cannot meet their potential to grow and reduce poverty. I can assure you that the UK will do all it can to press for a Doha settlement and will continue to push for full, duty-free, quota-free access for least developed countries. And we'll also continue to encourage donor countries to meet their aid commitments. I'm proud to be here as the Minister for International Development in uh, a government that despite our own economic difficulties we've, that we face, refuses to balance the books on the backs of the poor. We've set out a very clear pathway for reaching our commitment to spending 0.7% of our gross national income on official development assistance by 2013, uh, as Czech generously noted, and uh, we will, as promised, enshrine this as a commitment in law. So I'm pleased also to note that the UK is one of nine DAC countries which has met the commitment made in the Brussels Programme of Action in 2001 to allocate at least 0.15% of GNI to the least developed countries. But there is a caveat. The bargain we have made with the British taxpayer, and be assured, I get it every Friday night in the <coughs> neck from my constituents, and that's not a party political thing. This is from right across the piece, from the most left to the most right and most people in between. They are the ones who fund this aid program generously. And it is absolutely clear from them they want to see it well allocated, well spent, and not, absolutely not on the basis of an input target by saying how much we're spending. And so when I'm out abroad and have been, of course I get asked by as many of you in this room as I do by people out of the country, so how much are you going to put in there? So it's going to be my macho answers to how much of your money I've spent, which I always say, looking them straight in the eye, you have asked precisely the wrong question. What we're going to do is we're going to save 50,000 lives. We're going to provide 10 million people with condoms. We're going to, and it's the results that matter. So it's using the evidence of where aid can be used most effectively to deliver results for poor people. And that's the essential bargain that's vital to sustain the political will and the commitment of those who are so generously providing the funds out of their very hard-earned taxpayer money. And so the Secretary of State, as was noted for international development, uh, Andrew Mitchell, announced on the 1st of March the results of this root and branch series of reviews on our bilateral programmes and funding through multilateral organisations, which we set up when the coalition government took office last May. As a result of the bilateral aid review, DFID will continue to focus its efforts where the need is greatest, but specifically on the countries where the UK is well placed to have a significant long-term impact on poverty. Even large donors like DFID cannot work everywhere and hope to do so effectively. And we are committed to concentrating our efforts by winding down bilateral programmes in 16 countries over the coming three to four years. And I should add, that includes those which are graduating from aid. After all, surely, our common objective. Uh, but also those where either it's too small to make any impact, it's better through regional or multilateral uh, donations, or uh, where there has been a problem in getting any kind of implementation that's worth having. But uh, the last thing we'll ever do is ignore the poorest 
and find other we ways of getting there. So we won't achieve the Millennium Development Goals or eliminate global poverty if the international community doesn't address conflict and fragility more effectively. 22 of the 34 countries furthest from reaching the MDGs are in the midst of or emerging from violent conflict. To address this, we have decided that 30% of our aid will be focused on fragile and conflict-affected countries by 2014. But simply increasing the volume of aid won't be enough without tackling the underlying causes directly. There is a tendency in development to work around conflict and fragility. And there was another Nobel laureate, Amartya Sen, famously said that development is not just about freedom from, freedom from hunger, from disease, from ignorance. It's also about freedom to, the freedom of every person to take their lives into their own hands and determine their own fate. So recent events in North Africa and the Middle East are demonstrating, and indeed have already demonstrated, why it is critical that the UK, working with a broad range of partners, old and new, increases its focus on helping countries to build open and responsive political systems, tackle the root causes of fragility, and empower citizens to hold their governments to account. It's the best investment we can make to avoid violence and protect the poorest and most vulnerable in society. As you can see, I've touched on a large range of issues. There are a host more I'd love to touch on, but in the interest of time and maybe the Q&A session, I'm very happy to end it there. But thank you all very much. It's a very important uh, opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat>